had many ladies stashed in apartments throughout the city. Between his prostitutes and girlfriends, the man led a busy life, yet he negotiated those many relationships with skill and style. Why are y'all looking Riri's husband? <laughs> Hello, bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. I know you're like, Nay, what the fuck is that on your head? A do rag? I'm in a do rag kind of mood today. I have a haircut. My barber back home. I need to find me a barber here in Georgia until I relocate back home. But as of right now, baby, the do-rag is what you gonna get, okay? You still love me? I still love you. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it if the YouTube gets it. Now, whoa, let's continue reading Betty Lovett's A Woman Like Me with David Ritz. Was a Detroit pimp named Ted White, who we lovingly call Teddy Pimpy Whitey. That's right, Aretha Franklin's, what is that, her first husband. I call Ted that. a pimp because he freely called himself a pimp in my presence. He proudly described himself as such. Everyone who knew him well saw him not only as a pimp, but as one of the city's most prestigious operators in that highly competitive field. And that's why he got Riri. And that's why Riri got him. I know that since those days, Ted has turned himself around and became a model citizen. I applauded his makeover. But to tell the truth, which is the whole point of this book, I liked him back in the day when he was not walking the straight and narrow. I thought Teddy Pimpy Whitey was one of the coolest guys I'd ever met. I met him in 1963. I was playing the Palladium Club, which had just opened. Ted came in to book his wife. Hold on, is this the same Ted White that showed his ass down there in Muscle Shoals? Jerry know? Wexler convinced her to go down there to Muscle Shoals and sing because they had great... Yes, this is Teddy Pimpy Whitey. But there were great musicians down there. And then Ted thought that he heard one of the white people call him a nigga. And he was drunk and he started tripping and fighting everybody. I met him in 1963. I was playing the Palladium Club, which had just opened. Ted came in to book his wife, Aretha Franklin, who would follow me with a 10-day engagement. Ted caught the end of my show and then introduced himself. He wanted to know if I was Jimmy Joy's woman. I said no. I guess there was a level of respect between Teddy Pimpy Whitey and Jimmy Joy because typically the pimp, if he sees something he like, he would just go ahead and knock the pimp who the woman belongs to and keep it moving. And, you know, knock me, um, take the hoe. She belong to me now. But there is a choosing fee. I don't know the specifics of it all, but if you leave one pimp, for another pimp, you actually have to pay something because every hole has a cost. Depending on how much money you bring into the enterprise, just like the record business, you under contract over here. You got to pay me to let this hole out of her contract. Jimmy Joy was the biggest pimp in the city, the man Ted aspired to be. He wanted to know if I was attached to anyone. I wasn't. Did I want to drink? I did. Ooh, I guess Jimmy Joy would equate Bishop Don Juan. You know I love that man. I love him. 
He's a Sagittarius. He's amazing. I found Ted intriguing. I had no strong sexual desire for him, but I saw that he wanted me. In his stable, he wanted you, girl. I also I saw that he was extremely well-groomed. He wore black slacks and an expensive black silk jacket. There was nothing gaudy about his dress. His jewelry was tasteful, a vintage Rolex watch, a set of discreet gold cufflinks. Don't forget that Teddy Pimpy Whitey financed Aretha's career through his hoe. And it seemed like to me, Betty LeVette, and I'm sure I read this before, was one of his hoes. Okay, better press on. He was cultivated. He was a reader. You never saw Ted without a history or psychology book. Rarely did you hear him curse. I later learned that he was admired and envied by his colleagues for his ability to attract women. What he had in abundance and what they lacked was class. It helped that he was handsome, but it was his aura of intelligence and cool composure that made the ladies want to turn tricks for him. Betty LeVette, is that what made you want to turn a trick for him too? Of Teddy okay. Pimpy Whitey's many fine qualities, the best was his teaching ability. He knew how to instruct a woman on the art of being a lady. He knew where to take her to buy elegant clothes. He could distinguish one expensive French perfume from another. It was Ted who taught many of us the nuances of stylish dress. And I believe when Betty LeVette say us, she mean his hoes. In those days, we young girl performers tended to be loud and brash on stage and off. Ted was the first to say to me, look baby, when you're out in public, in a restaurant, or at a club, modulate your voice. Don't squawk. Speak. A whisper gets more attention than a shout. Men like women who talk softly. I can't do that, I said. I get too excited then control your excitement. I can't control shit, I said. Ted laughed. I could tell he liked me. It was more than the fact that I was 17 and Aretha was 21. He liked my free spirit. That spirit led to his bed. Mm -mm -mm. Why you fucking that lady husband like that, girl? Why you do that? You know goddamn well he married to the Aretha Franklin. Over the next several days, we started what would last decades. He became a good friend and a much needed mentor. Why the hell do the, the ladies of the evening always call their pimps mentors or managers? Okay, now if I was a ladies of the evenings, which I couldn't be because I, I don't accept all you know, I just can't do, I, I, I like to know what's coming to me. Because if I'm in a bed and then something is just uh, just too extreme for, for my situation, I want to be like, uh, I, no, I don't want to. And then I don't want to have no trick beat me in my face because I told him no. Uh-uh, I don't want to have that problem. And then I don't want to go and have the pimp beat me in my face because I told him the trick no. So no, mm -mm. that's why I say it ain't for me. I like to look at it though. It's interesting to me. He became a good friend and a much needed mentor. When I got in trouble and needed money, Ted was always there to help. Hustle Mom Martina said that that's what a good pimp do. I think she said when she worked for Kenny Red, he, he never left her in jail. Never. He always came and got her. Always. I wasn't his only other woman. He had many ladies stashed in apartments throughout the city. What the hell? Now, I would be mad if it was on Riri Dime, but it's not. He had many ladies stashed in apartments throughout the city. Between his prostitutes and girlfriends, the man led a busy life. Yet he negotiated those many relationships with skill and style. Why are y'all fucking Riri's husband? What is wrong with you ladies? Why are you fucking that lady husband like that? That's not right. We really trying to be a good wholesome woman. And you bitches out there philandering with that woman's husband like that. 
Fine with you, ho. When it comes to the history of Aretha, Ted had been unfairly maligned. I think he helped her enormously. I think he did too. I, no, well, not him. I think the hoes that worked for him did too, okay? So I won't take that, but I do believe Teddy Pimpy Whitey put a lot of time and them hoes money into her career. Ted has been unfairly maligned. I think he helped her enormously. He told me how Aretha's famous preacher father disapproved of their marriage. That motivated Ted even more to make sure that Aretha found fortune and fame. His main earner was a gorgeous prostitute. Men found irresistible. I adored her and I emulated her. As I always aspired to be the lady she appeared to be. Ted further explained to me that it was important for him to be a manager and that you had to live up to his standards in order for him to work with you. Meaning, bitch, if you get out of line, you can't be here. You do exactly what I tell you to do. Per. He seemed more like a uh, finesse pimp, okay? Like the Bishop Don Juan or who we have here. We're not here, but back home in D.C., Juju the Gentleman. Oh. Ooh. Ted was a great friend of Dinah Washington's, as was Aretha's dad. Ted used to say that his dream was to have Aretha kick Dinah's ass, figuratively, of course. Dinah was the reigning queen, and if Ted could tutor the new queen, if he could rigorously train and prepare Aretha for the crown and actually pull off her coronation, He'd accomplish a lifelong dream. Well, that's just what he did. This is where I go back to the movie Respect, and I remember Murray J. Blige's character. And remember, Aretha Franklin thought that she was doing something good or paying homage to Dinah Washington by singing one of her songs and Murray J. Blige, Dinah Washington character, got out of pocket and was like, you dare to sing one of the queen's songs? I'm like to myself, well, wait a minute, bitch. That's about to be the future queen. And it hurt her feelings. So she ran back into the dress room and started crying. And that's when Murray J had came back and was like, girl, poor you, you ain't got no damn hits. Poor thing. Okay, uh, all right, I feel sorry for you, but don't you ever sing one of the queen's songs. Ever. Title. She ain't had to sing no more of your songs because she took the goddamn title. As you can see, I'm a man's woman. It's fascinating and easy for me to see life from a man's point of view. Maybe a psychologist would say I identified more with my dad than my mom. Maybe that same psychologist would say that because I lost my dad early, I kept searching for him in all these older guys but I didn't go to a psychologist. Psychology is an intriguing thing. See, Lou makes me so sick. God bless all the psychologists, but... God bless all the psychologists, but therapy was not part of my life, then or now. I acted out of instinct. My instinct was to survive as a singer and prevail as a person. It didn't take a genius to realize that men held the key to that survival. Aside from a notable exception like Johnny Mae Matthews, men had a strange hold on the industry that in interested me most. Women were their props. The only question was what kind of prop was I going to be? 1963 and 64 were big years. The Four Tops had their first Motown hit, while The Temptations and The Supremes finally broke through. Barry Gordy was riding high. It didn't look like anything could bring him down until he got the news that shook him to his core. Murray Wells, his first superstar, was leaving. Mary had turned 21 and her lawyer argued that the contracts she had signed as a minor were invalid. It was her manager and former husband, Herman Griffin, 
who was moving her from Motown to 20th Century Fox Records. All this had a huge impact on me because Griffin was in business with Robert West, my manager. The Griffin-West combination with Murray Wells in their camp was a sure winner. They were already planning a tour and promising me lots of big gigs. After my second single flopped, I needed encouragement. By then, Bart Hollowell and I were living together on Trowbridge. That's the house where she lives with her mama, her sister, and the baby. He was a good man who babysat Terry and ran errands for mama. Bart would do anything for me. Meanwhile, I was still messing around with Ted White and wildly in love with Clarence Paul. Oh, no.